we're a couple minutes ahead of time and um, and we have Representative Lalonde with us from the Judiciary Committee. And so I think what I will do is, um, Martin, would you like to, would you like to wait until Bryn joins us or would you like to go ahead and give us a flyby of 119 on your own? You can, you can describe the process sure, or you sure. can let her describe the bill or whatever your preference is. Yeah, I can give a kind of a high level of where we are right now. <clears throat> um, so, so we've heard from lots of different sides on this, as you'll hear later. Uh, uh, we heard from a lot of individuals in the Black, Indigenous, and people of color and disability rights community. Uh, and we heard from a lot of law enforcement. Uh, we've tried to, to <clears throat> thread the needle and have compromises. You know, I'll be honest that uh, law enforcement is not completely on board with this, um, but uh, we think that we've ended up with a, with a very good uh, bill and will become better uh, after some uh, amendments, a couple amendments that you will uh, see today. Um, so the bill, uh, it, it uh, establishes uh, general standards for use of force and use of lethal force. Uh, and it leaves for working out the implementation details uh, to the policy making process that has already begun pursuant to the governor's executive order issued in August, uh, uh, which uh, doesn't have a deadline on it, but uh, uh, we will probably end up with a effective date for the standards of January 1st of 2021. Uh, the bill itself is July 1st, 2021, but uh, after consultation with our fellow members in the other body thought that uh, J January 1st would be fine. But in any event, the idea is to give that process enough time to uh, figure out those processes and any additional training that might be needed uh, to comport with the standards that we have in this bill. Uh, I will say that the standards that we have, and you will hear more later, uh, are, are consistent with, uh, and for the most part, really are the same as those standards that are already in law uh, that, that apply, which are through cases. Uh, but uh, the bill does certainly clarify a few areas uh, with respect to what current case law standards provide. And I think, in my view, I think the clarification should be welcomed uh, by law enforcement because the more I dug into the actual case law and standards, you know, there are some, um, inconsistent cases even in the Second Circuit regarding some pretty important issues that we have in this bill. So we have worked to try to address the concerns that we've heard from the other bodies so that this can go over there and to be concurred with. Uh, I'm not sure that we have addressed them all, but we've tried our best. Um, but I, I think that we will see it at least get to the floor over in the Senate. Uh, the two, uh, the couple of uh, Amendments, uh, I'll, I'll really point to just one particular one because it is pretty important. And that's the amendment uh, being offered by Representative Donahue. Uh, and one of the issues that we've been going back and forth with and really started with S-219 on the prohibited restraint crime. Uh, a lot of law enforcement have said, you know, that prohibited restraint, I'll just call them chokeholds. Uh, more commonly known as chokeholds, that that's something that uh, law enforcement officer uh, in grappling with somebody on the ground where it's a life and death situation, where there's a threat of death or imminent harm, that the law enforcement uh, officer may uh, find that a chokehold is the best way to deal with that issue. Um, so we really tried to figure out a way to make clear that there was a defense uh, if you use a chokehold in that situation uh, that 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 is, and it's a justified deadly force situation uh, that the law enforcement officer will be able to use that. Uh, and we did deal with that by uh, amending the justifiable homicide uh, statute. As it currently is in law, it's probably unconstitutional. So law enforcement wouldn't be able to point to that to say, hey, my use of a, the chokehold uh, was justified. Um, 
But the change that we have, which, which essentially incorporates the standards that we have in S-119 into that justifiable homicide bill, now that is something that law enforcement uh, can use as a defense. The problem is, is that we had a provision uh, in uh, S-119, and it is in the bill, but it will be eliminated through Ann Donahue's amendment, uh, that said that uh, prohibited restraints can't be used for any reason, which kind of adds, it makes it a little bit, a little confusing about whether it can be used in a situation of self-defense. We thought we had gotten around that, uh, but it, the more I've looked at it, the more I agree with uh, Representative Donahue, is we really had to go through some contortions to do that. So Ann Donahue's uh, amendment would remove that provision. Uh, and I think, I'm pretty sure that we're gonna find that favorable. I, I certainly find it favorable. Uh, and what that do, where that leaves us is, we do have the prohibited restraint crime, uh, but it's now clear that there is a provision in the justifiable homicide statute uh, that uh, makes, I think, I think makes it quite clear uh, that in the situation where really it's the last resort and uh, the law enforcement officer finds that using that instead of using the gun or maybe the gun's not available, uh, that, that they are going to uh, be found to be justified in the use of the prohibited restraint. I think, and I think that's a very important point that I'm pointing out because that's, I think, one of the major concerns that people have had with this bill. And I do think that we have now dealt with it uh, on the one hand, making very clear that prohibited restraints, that we are putting restrictions on their use, including in another amend amendment you will see, which, uh, which uh, bans the training of prohibited restraints, which is my understanding is just codifying current practice, uh, while also ensuring that, that if those are used in one of those dire situations, uh, law enforcement will have a defense. So. I know there's a lot of other stuff there, but I know that Bryn's on and she can do a walkthrough and I'm happy to answer other questions regarding our policy decisions, uh, if any come up. Great, thank you so much, Martin. Um, so I will invite Bryn at this point to take us on a jog through the bill and um, committee members, you can find this on the House Judiciary Committee page and uh, take it away, Bryn. Okay, good morning committee. Uh, for the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. Um, I did want to confirm one thing with Representative Lalonde first, which is um, I'm going to be doing a walkthrough of draft 5.1 that includes the instances of amendment that's going to be proposed. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I think that that makes sense just because uh, I'm pretty sure that the rest of the uh, uh, committee will find that, that favorable, yes. And I, and I mean the instances of amendment that um, have more than one instance. Right, right, the ones that, my, my amendment, right? Yes, exactly, okay. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so we're gonna be looking at draft 5.1. Um, I think that you should have that on your committee webpage. Um, and I can sort of point out the places where, where the instances, instances of amendment change the language here in draft 5.1. So a lot of this is going to look familiar to the committee since you've looked at this, um, a few iterations of, of this language. Um, section one creates the new um, section of law in Title 20 that governs law enforcement use of force and that includes force and deadly force. So we start out in subsection A with some definitions of words that are going to be used throughout the standards. Um, the definition in subdivision two, force, is a new uh, definition there, meaning physical coercion employed by law enforcement to compel a person's compliance with law enforcement instructions. Um, and if you turn to page um, two, the totality of the circumstances definition, there is, um, there will be a change to this definition based on uh, the amendment that's being offered by um, the representative Lalonde. And that is that the second, the second part of that long sentence is going to be removed. So instead it's going to read the totality of the circumstances means the conduct and decisions of the law enforcement officer leading up to the use of force 
and all facts known to the law enforcement officer so that or reasonably available to will be gone at the time, period. So that including whether a medical condition and the rest of that sentence won't, um, won't be there. So it's a little tricky to um, think about that, but if you've got the language right in front of you, hopefully that's pretty clear. So that um, second portion of the sentence will not be there and that reasonably available to language will not be there. So it will just be the facts, um, the conduct and decisions of the law enforcement officer leading up to the use of force and facts known to the law enforcement officer. So then I'll jump down to subdivision B if there's not questions about that. So this is the use of force section. This is the, these are the standards that govern, govern um, law enforcement use of force. So um, the, the sort of key language there is in subdivision two, which is at the top of page three. And that is the language that provides that law enforcement shall only use the force objectively reasonable, necessary and proportional to effect an arrest to prevent escape or to overcome resistance of a person the officer has reasonable cause to believe has committed a crime or to achieve any other lawful law enforcement objective. So that language has been expanded a little bit since the last time you saw it. <clears throat> so I can walk through each of these subdivisions, but since you've got kind of limited time, I'm gonna move down to subdivision C, which is the use of deadly force, unless I see some other questions. Um, so the use of deadly force is found on page four and the key provision here is C1. So this is the language that provides that law enforcement is justified in using deadly force if it's necessary um, to either defend against imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury to the officer or to another person or to apprehend a fleeing person for any felony that threatened serious bodily injury or death if that officer reasonably believes that the person will cause serious bodily injury or death to another if they're not immediately apprehended. So that sort of sets out the parameters um, that create the standard that deadly force can only be used if it's necessary in defense of human life. And then um, subdivision two there, I'm at the bottom of page four. This is the language that really puts some parameters on what the word necessary means in this context. So it provides that necessary, um, the deadly force is necessary when given the totality of the circumstances, an objectively reasonable officer in the same situation would conclude there was no reasonable alternative to that use of deadly force. I'm gonna keep going here, I don't see any questions. So um, subdivision three on the top of page five, I think this is also new language from the last version you saw. This provides that law enforcement has to stop using deadly force as soon as the subject is under the officer's control or no longer poses an imminent threat of injury or death to another person. And then as Representative Lalonde mentioned, subdivision six um, is being proposed to be struck. Um, and that's the provision that uh, says that law enforcement shall not use a prohibited restraint for any reason. Okay, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep going if I don't get interrupted here. So section two, this is the justifiable homicide statute. <clears throat> so you might recall that S-219 that passed over the summer repealed a portion of the statute. Um, so what this, what this, what this draft does is it uh, instead amends the justifiable homicide statute. So it does a few things to it, including updating the language, modernizing the language in subdivision one. I'm on page six now. And in subdivision two, it just sort of, it makes the intent more clear of what that subdivision means. And then subdivision three, this is the portion that um, relates to law enforcement. It just rewrites this, um, this whole subdivision to provide that law enforcement um, are entitled to a justifiable homicide defense as long as they use force that's in compliance with uh, some of the standards that are set, out, set forth in section one. So um, it provides that if they use force in compliance with B2, 4, and 5, they're justified. Um, or if they use deadly force in compliance with C1 through 4. So I can talk to you specifically about what those, what those cross-references mean. So 
subdivision B2, that's the standard, um, that's the key standard that sets forth the parameters under which law enforcement may use force, that um, objectively reasonable, necessary, and proportional standard. Um, subdivision B4 provides that um, law enforcement, that use of the decision to use force has to be objectively reasonable, and that's evaluated from the perspective of a reasonable officer in the same situation based on the totality of the circumstances. And B5 provides that law enforcement um, knows it's law, it provides sort of a duty on law enforcement that if they know that a subject's conduct is due to um, some type of impairment, uh, medical condition, uh, developmental disability, physical limitation, language barrier, or some other impairment, um, officer has to take that in information into account in determining whether or not to use force. Um, and if they do use force, what degree of force they should use. Um, so I didn't talk about that particular subdivision as I was going through the bill, um, but that is an important addition that's made in, in this amendment. <clears throat> and then the deadly force parameters that are cross-referenced in the justifiable homicide statute our C1, which is that standard that we just went through, that necessary in defense of human life standard. And then C2 is the description of what the word necessary means. C3 is that provision we talked about, law enforcement has to stop using deadly force um, as soon as the subject's under, control, under the officer's control or doesn't um, impose a threat of imminent death or serious bodily injury any longer. And C4 provides that law enforcement can't use deadly force against a person who only presents um, a risk to themselves and not to another person. So as long as law enforcement, um, law enforcement's use of force is in compliance with those standards that are set out in section one, um, then the, they are entitled to use this justifiable homicide defense. Does that make sense? I'm just looking to see if anybody has questions about that. Okay, I'm going to keep, I'll keep going then. So section three, um, this repeals the two sunsets that were set forth in S219 over the summer. If you remember, um, you imposed a sunset on that new crime for law enforcement uh, use of a prohibited restraint. And you also sunset that provision, subdivision three of the justifiable homicide statute that applies to law enforcement you sunset both those provisions in July of next year in S219. So because you've revisited the justifiable homicide statute um, and that uh, use of prohibited restraint in this bill, you've repealed those sunsets that you set out in 219. I'm gonna move on to section four. I'm now at the top of page seven. This is a new section um, that provides a directive to DPS to report um, back to the standing committees on the process by which they uh, develop a model policy, a model um, uniform statewide use of force policy for law enforcement, directs that report to come in um, on or before February 2nd of next year to this committee and the House and Senate Ju Judiciary Committees and the Senate GovOps Committee. Um, and it provides that the, they, the report has to specifically include what the process was like um, for DPS in, in uh, developing the policy, um, who they heard from, what stakeholders were at the table in developing the policy, um, number of times stakeholders met, opportunities for public comment, any outcome of that public comment, and also just um, what the final proposed policy is. Um, and then lastly, uh, section five is the effective date section, and it provides that the standards for law enforcement use of force and the changes to the justifiable homicide statute are gonna take effect um, in Jan on January 1st of 2021. That's another change from um, the provision you see here in draft 5.1, and that uh, the remainder takes effect on passage. All right, any questions from committee members? Jim Harrison. Thank you. Um, I don't know if this would be for Corinne or Martin, but um, a lot of this is in the weeds for some of us. Uh, 
uh, with the legal language. Um, but uh, so I appreciate you both going through it. Um, I guess my, my question is related to a characterization. Uh, one of the media reports recently quoted the Department of uh, State's attorneys to call it the most restrictive use of force law in the country. Is that a fair characterization or is that just the press reporting on something that's uh, perhaps fair? Well, let me take a first crack at this and Brim can correct me if I'm wrong on this. Uh, I think that that is correct if you're looking at statutory standards. Uh, there, uh, there are a lot of movements in a number of different uh, states right now to update uh, long overdue uh, updates on statutes related to use of force. Uh, I would say that in my view, having looked at the case law, which is currently really what where the standards are, uh, the evolving standards, uh, we are consistent with that case law. Uh, but as far as other statutes, yes, this would this I think in my view and, and Brink can correct me, uh, that this is the most restrictive uh, in large part because those statutes except for California and except for some other states that are looking at it right now, haven't changed in probably decades. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Any other questions from committee members for either Martin or Bryn? All right. Um, I want to thank you both for joining us this morning and, and uh, sharing with us your work on S-119 that will come to the floor later today. Um, I know that it has been a big lift for you all, and I appreciate the hard work that you've done in, uh, in moving this uh, policy through your committee and, and bringing it to the floor. We look forward to to hearing about this um, on the floor later today. Uh, last chance for questions, committee. All right, thank you, Martin. Thank, thank you, Bryn, you. for being thank with you. us. See you later on uh, the virtual floor. That's right.